All right, welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started tonight. We are going to do our presentation first. Awesome presentation. Hope some slides that I will introduce. Can you And the enrollment really begins to decline. 
Um, and then at the college level, you know, you have your difficult CS courses. So what we're really trying to do is be the bridge between those spaces. So offer things that are still fun, but are starting to infuse some um, rigor and problem solving throughout that fun. Um, these are some of our current teachers talking about their program or taxes, you know, not learning code. They're learning to draw things, but they're learning code while they draw. I've had students come to me and say, I actually enjoy coding because it's fun, it uses graphics, and it's well done. The students are so much more engaged. They come into the classroom before the bell rings, and they're at the computer with me. We're supposed to be in the hallway, and I talk to other teachers. And we look at my room, and we say, like, look, I don't even have to say anything. They're all working. And most of the time, it's um, kind of congratulating each other. Hey, you did a really great job, and you wait till you see this one. If I were to tell them to go into groups, they wouldn't necessarily want to, but they're doing it on their own. The curriculum uh, is top notch. It's better than any course I've seen. So one of the things that I've always struggled with in teaching CS is figuring out how to get this. The auto grader provides real time feedback for our students in a way that allows them to work at a very individualized pace. A student may miss a day or two, but they're able to stay on task, on track, and follow along. The process of giving immediate feedback has been very beneficial to my students. Also, given the teachers um, the ability to really give the kids a hands-on approach to their education and taking ownership of their education. These are probably issues that we get in teaching, but makes our lives easier. I don't have to prepare exams, assessments, everything. So I've simplified my life. I am able to help the kids that need it. I do a lot more one-on-one um, -on -one guidance. Even as a teacher, I admire that a lot. For me, it's a way to help them become career ready. It's given kids the ability to take ownership of their work immediately. And it's drumming up more interest in the I have, number one, doubled my enrollment in just one semester I was here. Yes. And I really enjoy them. I like all these off and I can go around them. I have a 5050 division each week and that's the way I was given to not excel in math design. They get into programming and they're just great. We teach students to our library on all months. You run that with model. The CNUCS is a good thing for us. I don't know if I would say it's easier. I think it's more important. Gary will want you to know that they are ready to learn. Would you recommend CNUCS Academy to another teacher? Yes, absolutely. Definitely, and I already have. So I would absolutely recommend CNUCS I would definitely recommend So that kind of gives you a little bit of an idea of some of the things that. Um, we're kind of providing throughout the CS Academy course. Uh, these are the two professors um, that kind of founded the project. Uh, they have a lot of history in the CS education and outreach space, um, including being involved in some of the um, AP CS creation. Uh, and then this is me and our full-time software engineer. Uh, but the rest of our team is actually a bunch of undergraduates at Carnegie Mellon. Um, it's, I think, one of the really unique and uh, valuable things about our approach. Uh, they are your direct resource. So when you have trouble in your class um, and you send in a support question, they're the ones that are getting back to you. Um, they're also heavily involved in the creation of the exercises that your students are um, experiencing. So uh, I'll get into this a little bit more when I show you the platform. But if you think about it like a high school math textbook, the notes in that textbook are written by the professors of the university, but then the exercises, like the exercise set at the end of a chapter, are um, these engaging animations that are created by our student team. And since they're maybe six years at most older than the students using them in the classrooms, um, they're typically pretty engaging and fun. Um, just to give you a little bit of an overview, uh, students are programming in Python. Um, and I got it. Thanks. Yes. So they're programming in Python, um, but they are using a um, graphics and animation framework on top of that um, that we built. It's called um, the 
in the graphics. So any part of the program in Python, if you're not familiar, if you want to make something graphical, you have to work with some sort of graphics package. Um, we chose to build our own graphics package because we didn't want students the first time they were coding and making something graphical in text-based language to have to write draw on a list when they really just want to draw a circle. Like, shouldn't it just be called a circle so it makes sense? So we made some decisions in the graphics package that we designed that um, make it really inviting and user-friendly for um, a high school student. Everything's browser-based, so it can use some Chromebooks. It's not a whole lot of fun on iPads just because having to type on the screen that you're also working with can be challenging, um, but it can be used there. It's all built in to the website, so you don't have to worry about any downloads or installs. Um, we have in-person professional development on campus. We also offer, starting in June, we'll have a like online professional development course that you can kind of walk through on your own time. Um, since it's South Jersey, I'd probably be happy to come down and do PD here sometime if we have enough people interested. Um, so that's probably something we can talk about. Um, and then, just to give you a little bit more about the actual course, there's interactive notes, meaning um, there's checkpoints throughout the notes that check to make sure students understand the concepts that they're covering before they're able to move on and do the exercises at the end of the unit. Um, all of the exercises are auto-graded with the exception of a creative task that they're supposed to do at the end of each chapter. We'll talk a little bit more about those too. And there's some anti-plagiarism features, um, which is really sounds pretty simple, but it makes a big difference. Students aren't able to copy and paste from outside of the site into the site. Um, so they can still like look at their neighbor and copy whatever, but at least they have to type it up themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, <laughs> you grab some of the kids. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so if you think about scratch, you can think about where they're headed. We're trying to be that bridge that's um, in between those two spaces. So the first course that we built is called CS1. It's a year-long introduction to programming. It's about 120 hours of instruction. It's the course that I'm talking about today. This fall, we are piloting with a really small group of teachers a ATCSP course that um, uses code.org's ATCSP curriculum and just replaces Unit 3 and Unit 5 um, with our programming platform. And it's designed so that a teacher can have a classroom of students that have taken CS1, that haven't taken CS1, that have taken a little bit of CS1. Um, because we know at most high schools, these CS courses aren't going to be sequential. So we don't want there to be any barrier of entry for that ACPSP course. Um, the CS2 applications course that we're planning to pilot next fall is going to be um, not apps in the sense of apps, but applications in the sense of applying everything they learned in CS1 to other subject areas, to seeing how computer science can be used in music and art, um, things like that. Um, and then our plans down the road um, involve, if you think about it like a triangle, our CS1 course is the bottom of that triangle. It's really designed for all students, and as you progress, things will get more challenging. Um, 15-1-12 is a course that's kind of known um, it's, actually, it's offered at Carnegie Mellon. It's one of the top five best computer science courses in the world. Um, so one of the founding professors of this project um, wrote that course, and the idea is to hopefully eventually offer that in an online format at a really reduced price for high schoolers. But that's, we've got a lot of logistics of the university to get through to make that actually possible. So. Um, that's kind of what our pipeline plan is. Um, I talked a little bit about PD already. Um, I don't want this to, but these are uh, two separate videos, and I'm actually going to share with you the bigger one. Uh, but there are some examples of students' creative tasks. So at the end of every unit, students are to think about everything that they've learned through all the exercises that they, they've done and try to create something with themselves um, from scratch. And Students that have created these things, it's a bunch of shapes layered on top of each other and gradient shoes and colors and opacities. Nothing that you see here is an imported image. Everything that you see is 
you, well, there's three. You have one. That, that's not going to work right. with my fire. That won't work. I can try to get them. Shame. <laughs> so, okay. But you, what you could do is you can create a classroom and they can be students in your classroom. Oh, so okay. Know okay. So they, they can at least experience the classroom. Yes. And then there's also, if you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the page, there's something called demo account access, which gives you access to like eight exercises okay. and a small sampling of notes. So you can play that's, with that yeah, too. That's good. Yeah. Um, Um, but as you progress through the curriculum, 
play and act with these types of things. How about, yay, there it is. But I don't know what to keep on. <laughs> uh, there, can we get back? Okay, anyway, so. They keep going. Um, towards the end, they get to a point, we actually don't have all of the curriculum deployed yet um, because we're still in our pilot. So we have one more unit published, but by the end of it, they get to um, exercises where they're starting to think about like actually planning out a really in-depth game. Um, so at this point, the exercises are no longer just these little mini things, and they actually build off of each other. So a student would learn to play cat-toe, and then they would go through the steps to actually build this game. And it's designed in a way to help, to help facilitate the idea of, okay, so now unit 12, our final unit is, you're going to do a final project where you um, create your own um, like final example of what it is that you've been able to do here. Um, that's, I don't know if you want to have any more of a tour of that. I can go to the teacher portal a little bit. It's not as pretty. Um, we definitely focus more on creating things for students prior to really um, building out an in-depth teacher portal. Um, a lot of the work we're doing over the summer is building out more here. But you do have the ability to add classrooms and then for your students to join that classroom. All they have to do is register with a code and then they create their own username and password. Within your classroom, um, you have the ability to set a pace. So if you want to run this course in a way where your students don't have the ability to just slide through everything. Um, you can block how far they in the curriculum they can access. This actually was created because last September, one of our current teachers called me and said, hey, Erin, my student walked into class this morning with a big grin on his face because he stayed up till 5 in the morning doing every single exercise. And it's Funny because what other class do you have where students are going to do something like that? Because you, you do have that problem with some some programming courses, I guess. So yes, yeah. so you you have the ability to block things. Um, you also have the ability to view your students' progress, and within this progress screen, um, you can like click on an exercise. If I scroll over to a um, creative task and I click on one of these, I can see, well, there isn't any work here, but this is our program, or web developer, but um, you would be able to see their code here, and you could run it, you can, you can actually share it too with a share link, so you don't, the share link doesn't share out student code, but it shares out a little stamp, like the, the Canvas side of it, so you're able to like share the actual project, but not share the code with others. Um, and then you can grade it right in here. You can actually just give it give feedback that students are able to see, and then they can request to resubmit um, if you want to kind of have an iterative process with them like that. Um, so that's kind of what the progress section looks like. You have a grade book that's messy, but it's exportable, so you can download it um, and add it into any grade book that you're working with. Um, Usernames are student created. CMU's crazy strict about us not collecting any information on your students. So we don't have the ability for you to like import your school list because we're not allowed to have that info. It's just the way that um, we work and I kind of prefer that anyway. We're not doing a research study on your students. We are providing a resource. Um, here you can see your list of students. Um, you can reset their password. Um, if they forget it, you could reset it if you wanted to block them from accessing things because they're not being paving. You can sign in at them and see everything that they're doing if you want to. Um, but you also have access to most of that within your progress tab. Um, you have in this resource tab, there's just some videos here, mostly tutorials on using the site some submission forms. This is that support tab I was talking about earlier. That's your direct line to our student team. Um, underneath the course information, you'll see there's um, our scope and sequence and also a pacing guide with this. And then within every um, section of this, there's also an example exercise. So if I open this up, 
this is what um, that shared exercise that I was talking about earlier, this is what that looks like. You're able to see the canvas, but you don't see the code behind it. Um, and then you're able to interact with things when we get later into it, and it's an interactive activity. Um, if I go back to our resource tab, um, there's also a course description. Within the course description, we have our standard alignment for CFTA, ISD, and um, K-12 CS framework. Um, we also are working on building out state-specific alignment, and I have finished these features already. Um, so that's linked here. Um, it's just a folder of more of that information if that's something that you need in order to get something like this approved. Um, the other thing that I wanted to take a little bit of time to show you is our creative task guide. Um, so we outline everything that's covered in every unit. We have a rubric. If you're familiar with APCSP, it's kind of similar to that, and then we provide um, a design and development guide. Um, one of the most difficult things, especially oftentimes for your strongest students, is to get them to come up with a creative idea to create. Um, so this is really there to help them do that. Um, and help them think about what code it is that is really valuable that they're working on learning to write. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much, I think, everything that I can share with you about the F Academy. Do you guys have any questions about that? Or, or you know, yeah. <laughs> now, is, is this ready for use for this summer? Um, yes, uh, I mean, you could. We'll still be building things out though. So you might come in and find more exercises there than you saw yesterday. For the fall school year, everything will be ready um, to go. Um, are you thinking about for summer camps or something like that? Right, right. So we're actually building a course called CS0, um, and that's really designed for that sort of setting because it's about 16 lessons of activities, so it's like a light version of this course. Um, we, we don't really provide this for summer camp use just because of so much content and if a student touched on it a little bit somewhere and then they go and they're supposed to be taking it as a class their freshman year, there's going to be some weird overlap there. So, um, but, but that CF0 of course will be available like late June, mid-July, so, or early July, so yeah. Um, I can definitely share more about that with you too. And when students sign up for an account, they need to sign up with a no. no. Yeah, we don't, we don't use email, nothing. Yeah. Hmm. Um, yeah. So um, the only other thing that I was going to share today, um, and I'll go through this a lot quicker than I did yesterday stuff, but uh, prior to this job, so this time last year, I was teaching K-8 computer science um, outside of Pittsburgh. So, how I got pulled into this world is I took that 112 class a couple summers ago because my school district asked me to write K-8 computer science curriculum and I had never taken a CF class. Um, so I took that course, then applied what I learned from that in the curriculum that I built at my school, and then I had the opportunity um, later on to join this project. So, so yeah, but I do miss some of the fun things that I used to get to do in K-8. Um, this next Right here, I just have links, kind of like a spreadsheet of different activities I did with different grade levels. Um, if that's something that would be useful to you or another colleague of yours, you're welcome to share that like, with anyone. Um, in K-2, I did a lot of station stations. Um, I took over for a position that was um, mostly focused on like typing and traditional computer lab type of stuff. And the district really wanted to shift more towards like modern, they were calling it CS, right, for K-8. Um, but you can't forget some of those traditional things, like when you type, because you still need that. So we, what we did with the littlest ones most days was, um, I had them for 45 minutes, once every six days, so about, about 30 times a year. And they spent about 15 minutes at each station. So we used Puzzlet, which is a, um, wireless um, play tray that communicates with an iPad and um, it's, a, it's a game kind of like Mario where students put 
blast in sequential order and they have to plan it out ahead of time and then they, and then they have to tap through it on their screen. So it's really nice for paired play because both students actually have a job. Um, it's not like they're constantly fighting over who's holding the iPad because the person that's in charge of the tray can be in charge of planning. I always talk about it like one's the driver, one's the passenger, and the passenger holds the map and tells the driver the direction. Um, so that was great. Um, we also did, we used Bbox. I love these. They um, are this little B-shaped robot with just arrows on top of them. And he travels, I think it's like, I want to say a foot with each, with each crest. Um, so I created a big letter mat, and we would practice their high-frequency words by having them write code to travel to those letters. Um, so we did that. We used Scratch Junior, which is always fun. Um, and then our third station was typing. So we still spent some time with typing. Um, I wasn't rigid about typing in that age group because their fingers aren't big enough to touch everything yet. So forcing them to do, like, home row, they can't really reach all of it. So um, we did that a strict thing in fourth grade when their hands were ready for it. But in K-2, we kind of just let them play. Um, so yeah, this is the puzzle thing I talked about. Um, and then something else, this was probably like my favorite activity that I did with them, is our school district always had a bunch of old keyboards lying around. Um, so we will watch a video from that What's Inside channel on YouTube where like a father-son team cuts stuff open and then talks about what's inside. And then I have them um, imagine what they thought was inside of the keyboard and they draw these like things with little like Elves pushing the key back up when you push it down, you know, what kids you kids are going to come up with. Um, and then the next class when we got back together again, we'd actually open up the keyboard and talk about that um, and how it all works. Keyboards are really simple. There's like a few layers of plastic and um, there's a middle layer that separates two layers that have like some conductivity in them. And when the top one touches the bottom one from you pressing on the key, it sends the information to the computer. So it's like a concept that K-2 can get. Um, and they, they loved it. It was great. Um, and then in third and fourth grade, I, I worked in a district that had a lot of resources. So we had everything you can imagine. Um, Pittsburgh puts a lot of money into this STEM stuff. So, so we had a lot. Um, I did a battle box activity with them that was one of the most fun things. I introduced Jack in third grade. Um, and Spiros are super fun because you can also do um, like long exposure photography with them in a dark room. So they like program the, bot the balls to roll around the floor and we um, took some photos while they were doing it and then talked about how that works. Um, and then the battle box activity, again, used the Spiros. And I just got a bunch of plastic cups and had them work in teams um, to build like their battle bot design and uh, the bot was a bunch of like skewers and toothpicks and then they had balloons that they had to try to pop each other's balloons. That was the battle bot um, situation. So that was an awesome project. It nearly failed because I tried using balloons because that's what I thought I should use. And it doesn't work with regular balloons. You actually have to fill water balloons with air. They pop easier. Um, so like the first, luckily I get to do, I did every project six days in a row, so I got to like, you know, <laughs> figure out what was going to work and what wasn't, but um, this was a lot of fun. And it was all things that was like building a lot of excitement around um, programming and also the like iterative design process. Um, and then in fifth and sixth grade, we used something called the Hummingbird Robots, which are actually a project out of Carnegie Mellon, um, they're Pittsburgh-based. They're probably my favorite thing to implement into CS education. Um, they're Arduinos for kids. So the ports are a little bit bigger. You can program them with Scratch. You, they have them set up so that you can program them with like almost any language you can imagine. Um, but all they are is the Arduino with like, like sensors, LED lights, all of that. But then the students have to actually create whatever it is that they're trying to create. So, um, I think I have some pictures on here, but the one year we did something where they built a robot based off of a children's book and like, 
we brought those robots down to the primary center and put them out with the kids' books. So there's like an elephant for the elephant and piggy book, and the elephant was like, his eyes would light up when you came up to him or something like that. Um, did you use them for micro bits or did you use them without the micro bits? This was before the micro bit thing existed. The micro bit yeah. Um, but that's it's an awesome thing too, yeah. Um, we also, since Uber, Uber's uh, like advanced technologies thing is in Pittsburgh, so where all the robot cars are driving around, that's in our city. Um, so you constantly see like cars with sensors on top of them driving around town. Um, at least for a while, you know, they got taken off of the road for a little bit. But when that was happening, our fifth graders were also learning about like how cars worked in science. So in my class, we used the hummingbirds to create, to build cars for future cities. And they came up with different things, but like some groups created intersections where the lights would change if something approached it. Others built cars that would like stop rolling forward if it was about to run into a wall, things like that. Where they're just starting to like think about how these things actually work. Um, and this resource really makes it easy to bring that um, like advanced topic down to a, a younger age group. Um, and then the other thing that I really love that we did was um, the Girls Who Code organization started putting out some books. Their, their nonfiction books are great, but I, I love their fiction series. It's written like um, the Babysitter's Club books, but instead of meeting at a Babysitter's Club, they meet at a coding club after school. And they all have different backgrounds and interests, um, and they like solve mysteries and scandals, and it's a lot of fun. Um, so I think four of the 14 are out so far. Um, but that was a really nice way to kind of energize computer science with, with that middle school age group. Um, these are the robots I was talking about earlier. Um, our middle school also has now started doing this with our discoveries curriculum, which I have um, heard from my colleagues that it's going really well. And it's serving to be like a really nice jump from block base to code.org discovery, because you can toggle on block and um, text-based JavaScript, and then going into the CS1 course um, prior to the ATCSP, it just is it's working out to be a nice pipeline for them. Um, this was something we did with our music teacher, um, where we used the Nikki Nikki and uh, did Christmas carols, um, but had like the computer program doing it. Um, this was nice for the really young kids. We built circuit blocks where there's some pretty good tutorials online how you can do this with just like a soldering iron. Um, where And then you use um, like alligator clips to connect them to a battery and they start getting an idea of how circuitry works. Um, BrainPop always has really good videos to go along with that. This Invent to Learn book is full of ideas for like maker-ish education. Um, yeah, and then uh, prior to coming, we talked a little bit about just the other things that are going on at Quincy Island. I haven't been there very long, so I'm not um, totally in ingrained in all of the things that are happening, but these are three things that I'm at least relatively aware of. The Create Lab is more of a research-based group, but that's how Bird Brain Technologies was created. They were a project that came out of them. They do a ton of really great things, so um, all of the, the websites are linked in this slide deck, so you can go and explore it yourself. But they have a lot of awesome things that are happening. Um, and the Robotics Academy, we're not connected with at all, um, but they've been around for, I think, like 20 years. And if any of you are familiar with, like, Robot C, which is like a virtual environment for programming robots, they created that, um, and I think they do a lot with that and first robotics type of stuff. So that's
I know you said that there's another team that deals with the robotics, but would you happen to have a, like, is there a contact person there who we're actually looking to use their curriculum next year for robotics? Yeah, if you email me, I can email you. I have a meeting with her next week. I haven't met them yet, but yeah. by that time. we did research, like, we have yeah. access to it. It's, I think it's got, like, this pretty much free, I think, tool. Um, or I, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know about that. Maybe it's just the hardware that you have to pay for. Okay. I don't know. I know they're not completely free, but they're also hardware related. So. Okay. Yeah. We, we put her email in the slide show, right? Yeah. Three emails in there? Yeah. Uh, my question was, uh, how would you differentiate the your core product offering from the code.org or code academy? Okay. Because a lot of them have this integrated ID with feedback and yeah, those kind of things. Yeah, yeah. And more wealth and visits. So, uh, I mean, how do you... So, um, i say we're... Code.org has some great things, but they're scattered. So they have the Discovery course, they have ACCSP, but they don't have a course in between. So our CS1 course is really designed to bridge that gap between those two courses. Um, as far as Code Academy goes, they're definitely meant to be like a self-guided on your own, not meant for a formal classroom. Um, and they also don't do graphics. Um, I'd say the biggest difference with what we're offering is generally speaking is students are programming in Python, so they're doing actual text-based coding in a real formal professional language, but they also get to do so in graphics and animation. Um, and not many people are doing that. Um, like CodeHS has a really awesome JavaScript course, but they don't have an offering in Python that is as graphic heavy. Their Python course is really challenging. It's meant more for older students. So I, we're, we're trying to fill this gap in the market where there's all these great things out there for K-8 to have a lot of fun. And there's all these great things out there to challenge students in high school. But there's not a lot that's bringing them on a path. So we're trying to provide something that can be that. And I just from having used code that were great well, their language is JavaScript. I haven't seen much with Python. Yeah, so that would be one different thing. Like that's one of the reasons why I was like, wait, I kinda wanna get into Python a little bit, but I didn't know anything else. Now, Python's a fantastic language. Code can we have the behind the pro paywall curtain that have a Python thing? This looks pretty cool. You know. Yeah, and code yeah, that was Java too, right? That was Java. They're they have two. Their their um visual stuff is draft is JavaScript. So but then they do have a Python course, but it's challenging material. It's meant more for older students. Yeah. Okay, well thank you. Thank you so much. All right, so we do have a little chat of business to discuss. Probably good for this pretty quick. Um, new members.
Was it the institutional one? Or That's the institutional one. Right. We pay for it. We pay for it. I think so, yeah. <laughs> well, you, you you like I, will, I will look into that. <laughs> our, our chapter of um, their advisors, let's be scheduled. So I'll, I'll, uh, I'll look that up for you. And I'll be in touch. Yeah, here, I got this. Is the, my, my Can you send that to me? Yeah. Yeah, let me write down my email address for you. It is a 20. Yeah, we will figure that out. Yeah. <laughs> We show up two years later. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Every year we have to like, read yeah, a membership. Yeah, right. um, um, one, one membership is the CSKA Plus membership, mm -hmm. which you get extra access to exclusive resources. That's a $50 membership for the out there. Okay. Really, the premise behind this is it was free. The $50 charge is because he's trying to do more, provide more resources, and obviously for that comes cost, provide those things for his members. So you do get some extra tools and access as a result of what it is not required. Right now there's a lot of discounts on the kinds of things you can buy for your classroom. Okay. Mm -hmm. That membership gets you that. Oh, got it. Take back your advantage. Um, so we got our officer team. On um, this email, they go out from CSA National. I think everybody should be receiving this. Um, they are, they started, they're cleaned off the websites and now the website and they're connecting to chapter websites. And one of the things that they are doing is they are updating chapter information and personal information. So I could probably try to see, are you writing districts? What are you doing in your districts? How to collect some information? So one thing that they, they've done to encourage teachers to actually go to the website and make sure that everything on there is correct is they're doing different checkpoints. We are past May 3rd one, obviously. But the CSA chapters for the most members at the end of May 3rd, 10th, and 17th will win $1,000. And that's the chapter. Eight membership. Yeah. Eight membership. Yeah. I did not see that they had a lot of members. I did not see that. Right, so that's kind of neat. For our chapter, we know that we have our programming competition, which is a big event. So that would always be helpful and there would be different things. Have that one. So if you receive that email, go ahead, take a look, update your account. It doesn't take much time. Like not much to be done at all once you get logged in. Do we get logged in? When I did it, it took me about two minutes. <laughs> when you say most members, members of our chapter of CSTA? Most members of our chapter. So whatever chapter has the most members that go ahead and register and update things at the checkpoint, that specific chapter on chapter will get the money. So that email is coming. That's up. We have our websites keep in touch with Facebook and Twitter. We have a new logo. I don't know if this has been finalized, but what yeah. CSTA did is they said you can use the CSTA logo, whatever. Uh, chapters can take their own colors, so we want to put the white, blue, and black there. So that is our new logo. Like I said, same as everybody else, but the color design, you were allowed to visualize for your specific chapter. Well, <laughs> no, sorry, this is not <laughs> it was as close as I could get to stop the colors. The stock has been very so generous yeah. to share the space with us and sponsors and competitions and everything. We would not have this meeting. Yes. Awesome. Uh, in fact, Aaron was saying they don't quite have this set up. In <laughs> <laughs> so uh -huh. um, some CCNJ notes. Once again, just keeping up with everything. Remember, we have our chapter. We have our two other chapters that do awesome things. We have our CSTNJ.org website, which kind of ties all the chapters together so you can see the different things. As you've seen this year, the push has really been to promote all of the chapter meetings to everyone in the state of New Jersey so that if you see an opportunity that you find interesting or need, that maybe you attend that meeting in that region or I think more Jersey just left like it. I was on that. So we're to do Google Hangouts as well. I think it's really awesome because you get to see and hear a bunch of different things. Um, 
Twitter, at CSTA, New Jersey, hashtag CSTA and J. Anything that you're doing in your classrooms or CS things that are happening in your district or just spreading the word in general, make sure you put those things and promotion out there. Um, we've talked about legislation and all the things that are in the works, but this is always an ongoing process of promoting it and keeping it in the forefront of everybody's minds, whether it's our business partners or businesses in the area, legislators, principals, superintendents, all the people that need to know the importance of CS education, and then seeing these things online kind of address on that point. For a couple of shout outs here, so we have the Girls Go Cyber Start competition, which is currently in second stage right now. New Jersey is doing an extreme wellness competition. We had the second most girls participate in the country. The only state with more participants was Texas. And they're very far ahead of us in all other areas. So that's like amazing. And so that's awesome. Basically, it's kind of an opportunity for girls to explore different challenges and learn about cybersecurity. It's all student driven. Or no, like lessons for the teacher to teach or extra keys for the teacher to the right the students with. The students are all doing this on their own. Um, there was, there's three stages. The first stage was like a practice stage. Then there was a second stage, which if you had a certain amount of girls complete a certain amount of challenges, you qualified for the second stage, which is more of a competition stage. That stage actually ends May 15th, I believe, or that's when scores will be evaluated. And from there, the state of New Jersey will pick, I don't know if it's one school or a handful of schools to represent New Jersey at a national, in a national competition, which will also be online. Um, the things on the board here for the prize money here, um, at the first stage, based on participation, the schools with the most students participating, including a certain amount of levels, received a monetary award. So we had Oakcrest High School and Moore Hills both had the same amount of students participating. I forget what that number was. I'll pop my head. I want to say about 60. So that's 60 girls participating in cybersecurity, roughly right in that range. The pretty significant number when you think most schools aren't even getting 60 students in a computer science classroom. So congratulations to them. Bergen County Academies was awarded 500 for their participation level. In addition, since these other schools had such high levels, they were also awarded money, varying amounts based on how many people actually are participating, how many girls are participating. So you can see Jersey did get great participation, which is awesome to see. And then it's great to see that this money is being awarded and these schools can do some different things with those. Right. So the competition is kind of sort of I think more basic. Oh, it's sure. It's more friendly. Sure. It's more friendly. Um it's a bunch of different challenges, just random challenges that the girls go ahead and they do it on their own and it could be stuff as simple as typing some Python to just like puzzle solving or just using some logic, like, you know, this, this, and this about a person, trying to figure out their password, it's in this information. So it's, there's some higher level programming stuff to it, and other parts are kind of like, look how easy it is to figure out your password, where you're going, kind of deal. So you have a variety of things. Um, I from Township High School, I actually won the random drawing. <laughs> you know how? Uh, <laughs> it was random. It was random. That was for every five students you had that participated, you got like one entry for random drawing. And they were on that. So you can come to the thousand dollar board. That's kind of neat. I'm not complaining about that. <laughs> um, there's a link there to a little write up that goes on your start to did. If you wanted some more information. I think one of the important person to recognize is Mandy Galante, who is the CyberSart program director. She was actually an educator in the state of New Jersey. I believe she used to teach at Red Bank, Red Bank Catholic Original, and then she went to Mater D and she worked at Mater D High School 
And those guys told them Red Bank has a really strong cybersecurity program. She kind of started that whole thing. So now she's moved on to this competition. She's done an amazing job, whether it's pushing out through schools in New Jersey, as well as every other state that's participating in the competition. Kind of need to see our schools doing well and actually have a New Jersey person that's really pushing cybersecurity and cybersecurity education. Okay. That's important to recognize her. Another shout out, Marianne Hayes received a scholarship in housing to attend the experience programming in Quorum. Quorum Conference in Portland, Washington. And she received a scholarship for air and housing. It's awesome. It's going to come to teach at Penny's how to teach students computer science using the Quorum program language for blind students. And thank you for I 
Uh, they did add a block swatch rule now. Where you, you know, so I guess maybe that could take a time of the upgrades. Yeah. You know, but um, it would be nice if you could disable it for certain accounts. <laughs> uh, so no, I'm, I'm not a, I against blocks. You know, I'm not against them. I'm just saying that sometimes if you if your if your if your goal is to teach actual coding. I know, yeah. So I just, but here's the thing, though, with that, oh, never, never going to get into it. Because here's the because it's high level languages, right? Now you have these guys that program like assembly, and they're like, oh, these high level languages where you have to use cold books and do objects and stuff. So, yeah. Well, that's job. That's not real programming. No, I didn't mean that. Every level is like, that, that level of bug is not real programming, and blocks is the new kid on block. Yeah. So everybody's like, blocks is the real programming. But like, no, I didn't mean to be like that. But no. yeah, I think it will, I think it will be a way more popular. Well, I actually did more than a than a set. But um, <laughs> I didn't really need to say that. Okay. I love that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a good exchange. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. All right, so I'm going to speak Mondays. Oh, Sundays are all. We have just the third left, right? Or okay. Sorry. It's the 13th. On, on the 6th, which would be the time, that was really cool because we had some. New robots that came in. We have the Coov and we have the, um, the Root robot, and they were both amazing. I'll send you all a video of people that were building with it. A couple of real really likable guys. Yeah. <laughs> 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 well, I'm going to we're going to be putting the summer ones up in the next couple of days, so there'll be some summer makerspace Mondays, and then the list for fall will probably go up around the same time, probably for more together. So. We just need um, we just have to finalize our summer schedule because they changed the timings here on campus. Um, went from a, a four-day work week to a five-day work week, so we had to figure out how we were going to schedule all that. And um, we're not always going to be working on Monday. Yeah, I'm so not going to be working every Monday. Be, be so, so they'll be at least three for the summer. I can't be. Well, I, I mean, I could change it to, if you've got a catchy title for Tuesday, send it to me. And Tuesday. Well, we did that, we did that like two summers ago. Yeah, Tuesday's a little hat. Yeah, it's got to be, it's got to be tied with me. Yeah, you, it's got to be a wire Wednesday. Wire Wednesday. I'm going to, I'll put it right on the slide show. Awesome. So, but I'll email everybody. I'll email everybody. Oh, what else do we have here? We got the drone day learning symposium, which is Sunday, May 31st. Okay, May 31st. Uh -huh. Friday, May 31st, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. at DCCC, with two your keynote speaker there. Maybe you can find leaders in the industry, learn how drones can benefit your business. There is a fee to this. I'm just having a hundred dollars a day. If you go to the event for it, it will tell you the exact amount. Uh, before you go on to the next thing, we do have a, a high school and a, a K to eight uh, two day thing that I'll add into the slide. Wait, there are two separate days. That one day is K to eight. October second and October third. Um, we have K to eight. Uh, CS Integration Day, and the third is the high school CS Integration. So again, just like last November's event, these are for people who are not teaching CS currently, and if anybody wants to submit a proposal to teach a 90-minute workshop, somebody, we would really appreciate you submitting a proposal. Yeah, I can do that. I've been, I've been putting it in the CS New Jersey uh, thing, but I'll email it again. Yeah, you. I can, I can do, do one of that, that non-programming language scratch. I can do a little, a little scratch thing. Is, can, you you can, you it, can you gear towards high school? Can you gear towards high school? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, because I need some, I need some people on that. Yeah, we do, that. I, I do retro. Keep in mind, I teach app and that's all. I practice. know, that's all direct here. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. I didn't even no, tell you. No, I'm not, I, I didn't, I think, so I'm just, I'm no, no, I'm not. 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 I'm
<laughs> Not just a cat moving around in a circle or twisting around in a circle. We, we do some complicated mm -hmm. stuff. I, I sent it out to the staff. I don't know if it's very... If you want to do uh, complicated stuff with Scratch, have you seen the Project Guts? Project Guts? E-U-P-S. So the, it's using Scratch to kind of simulate if there is a spread of virus or some... Oh, oh, oh the 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 graphic like simulation, yeah. you know, so you could program and see if there's some outburst or some disease or something. Oh, so yeah. it's again for features, you know, project guts. It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's robust enough yeah. that you can do a whole bunch of stuff and it's easy enough to understand that you can get easy at it really fast and skip to that part where it's like, I know how to do, like you can think about the problems and not about how to program stuff. So like, which, which takes a long time in another normal language. Way longer better. So you can skip ahead to, oh, how do I do this thing instead of like, all right, what do I need to program? Why is that one of the missions I've learned? Is it team? It's very easy. We can see the title, the little description, you have to select which CSTA standard it, it addresses. And um, it's on. If you want to do more than one session. Yeah. I can do, I can do web programming too, I can do computer hardware. I think it's just three that I would do most okay. I don't know if you guys need or what you already have or... Well, what we already have is already on the website. Oh, the whole thing's there. Okay, cool. Yep, so you'll see proposed sessions. Those are the ones that um, are already being proposed. So we're almost done filling our K-8 slot. Um, but we, we're looking for high school now. Okay. So we, we, we could use Adam. Yeah. You could release Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my God. He lives and dies. He lives and dies by that last But I can probably get a couple of I'll work on it. Okay. Yeah, and even Brian, Brian can do something on the cool book. I sent it to them. Okay. But I have to, I'll send it again unless I'm doing the deadline. Like I, I, I feel like there's a, there's, you know, you need to see some more. Yeah. Let's see. All right. All right. So that kind of wraps everything up. Our next meeting is July 17th. Oh, Abby's in there saying, I want to do a presentation for high school. Is there need for anything specific? I don't Oh my God, there's oh, other okay. people. <laughs> <laughs> Abby. Oh no. Sorry. Let's <laughs> archived. Well, good question. Listen to these nerds talk about the nerds. <laughs> Oh, oh, I, feel, I know, Thank right? I feel so dumb. Thank you, Amy. Uh, Thank you, Abby. July 17th, we have a date yet? Um, that's the date. Yeah, we'll I'll, uh, I'll follow up with Joanne tomorrow and we'll get the location. Um, I'm a little worried about, I know we talked about having it in a bit on our Linux campus, which is absolutely gorgeous. It's so gorgeous. So I'd have to yeah. find out if we could get parking. Right. Um, there or not. Let me find out. So, yeah. No, it'll probably... Oh, oh, do you think it's should be in the day? Oh, I don't think it's summer. It is summer. We're not, it's not at lunch. Uh, it's not at lunch. No. Like it has been. Yeah. not doing that at lunch. And parking fine better a little later. Yeah. But we're not going to do that at lunch. No, the lunchtime thing in Texas is it wasn't working at all. It's too, it's too hard. Because we're always presenting the way to run, like 1590. Maybe we can send an email out about times, so what well, times work best for people and based on feedback. I can send a doodle. Yeah. Yeah. All, right. all right. As always, if you have any topics you want to learn about, let us know. Interesting presenting, let us know. You can come for all sessions you need. Let us know. You never know where you're going to find an actual speaker. Mm -hmm. Tonight, I just I actually signed up for that CS Academy for my class, and then everyone's like, hey, I'm from that area. And really? And I'm like, do you want to come speak? Oh, I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, great. I got to make a speaker. I don't know how this just happened. <laughs> that worked out well. It did. So you'd be surprised. But, so just keep things in mind as you do.